workers, organizers, and uh, to the public. Uh, this is the first of a series of uh, roundtables and webinars, which is dedicated to digital transformation between Italy and Russia. It is organized by Gimo University in the person of Yekaterina Brozimova, uh, in collaboration with the law firm De Verti Yakia, the government of the Russian region, the, the Moscow region, uh, in Nova and uh, Behab for Europe. Uh, this uh, event steam, stems from a series of roundtables that uh, was dedicated at fostering the use of mediation between Italy and Russia. At the last of this event, uh, the idea came out of uh, expanding the scope of our, uh, let's say, uh, intervention and to, to consider the idea of discussing also digital transformation between Italy and Russia, uh, which represents nowadays one of the key elements uh, which can help us to come out of the crisis and uh, of the pandemia for COVID-19. Uh, this is the reason why I decided to, to focus on this topic. And we basically would like to, 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 to build the links between governments uh, and uh, institutions and the private companies uh, across border. And uh, we try to build bridges and links between our two countries uh, on the assumption that it should be the companies, the private sector who should uh, take the lead uh, and instead of the politician dictating what to do or what we cannot do. So the idea is to improve the partnership between our countries by, by discussing topics which can be helpful for, for, for all of us. Uh, of course, this is just the first of our series of webinars, so any suggestion from the audience is welcome in order to improve the format and especially in order to to select the topics of the next, uh, the next discussions. And now let me go through the, uh, the program and introduce the speakers. Uh, we decided to divide the program in, two, in three sections. The first section is business to government and the speaker will be Azamat Akishev. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Kirill Fedin will not be able to, to make his presentation even though he's present at uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. And then on the Italian side, we will have uh, Eduardo Colombo. Uh, second section will be dedicated to business to business. Uh, we'll have on the Russian side, uh, Raquel Tretiakova, uh, whereas uh, Aleardo Furlani will speak from the Italian side. Uh, finally, the cyber section, where uh, we'll have uh, on the Russian side, Andrei Suvorov, and on the Italian side, Marco Sirelli will substitute uh, this if you unfortunately cannot join today. So this is, uh, the, let's say, the program that we'll follow today. At the beginning of each section, there will be some polls, and so you will be uh, welcome to give your feedback on, on the questions that we will answer to you. And at the end of each section, we will we'll concentrate all the questions and answers. So in order to avoid just to split too much our presentations, uh, so that to concentrate on each section and uh, the group of questions all at the same time. So let me start and I'll give the floor to Mr. Azamat Akishev, uh, who will speak to us about the analytics of the Moscow agglomeration population based on the geoanalytical data. Please. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe yes. uh, that would be more reasonable to start with the poll to, yes. to, to, to introduce the section. So we have uh, some sort of polls. I'm uh, very honored to welcome you from the side of Ngimo University. And uh, here today I'm only more for technical assistance, but we have already had some uh, roundtables on digital, on digitalization, uh, in law, in legal relationships. Uh, and uh, we are extremely happy that uh, our Italian friends and our Italian colleagues are interested in joining this and uh, in conducting this event today because it's much more uh, useful and much more interesting to exchange experience. That's why we have thought of these polls because it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about digitalization in our life? Uh, well, uh, linked with the topics of the sections. So now you will see the first poll. Let me see. Okay, can you see that? So please vote.
you cannot even think of how intriguing that is to watch the results changing. Like political elections. <laughs> Absolutely. So the Oscar goes to... Okay, uh, as we can see for now, um, most of uh, the people present here um, think that uh, the digitalization of public administration is slowly but steadily improving. Uh, nobody says that public administration doesn't have a website. That's very positive, and I'm very happy to see that. Uh, well, three, three participants even think that digital communication with the administration is perfect, and that's, well, that's wonderful. Maybe Azamat is among them. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> now I give the floor to Azamat Akishev. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you very much. It is a big honor and a privilege uh, for us to speak on this forum. Uh, I would like to share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, first of all, I would like to, um, just a moment. I would like to point out your attention uh, and um, for the Italian colleagues that uh, maybe doesn't know, uh, maybe don't know about uh, our uh, territory, I would like to show you the map. Uh, this is called uh, Moscow agglomeration. It is uh, Moscow that you, you see here, this part, and uh, around it, it, it is called Moscow region. And both uh, these subjects of Russian Federation administrative uh, regions, they are called uh, Moscow uh, agglomeration. So first of all, I will speak about uh, uh, that part, big part. I'm the representative of government of this uh, Moscow region. And then I will share you uh, the experience of uh, Moscow city regarding um, the uh, geoanalytic uh, analysis. So let's start uh, on our presentation. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I'm not a specialist uh, in technical point of view. I'm not from IT sector, uh, but uh, in the government of our region, we uh, discuss uh, some information regarding uh, the dynamics and uh, uh, of movement of people, population size. And it is very important for us because uh, uh, there is um, uh, an issue of uh, taxes, an issue of uh, the resources that we have for people. So there are companies, uh, several mobile companies that gather information about uh, citizens uh, via mobile phones we know that we every day move to other um, to different uh, places. We commute. We download a lot of information from internet. So uh, uh, the data that is um, uh, collected is um, uh, anonymous uh, and um, is uh, absolutely uh, legitimate uh, and complies with uh, legislation. So uh, there is no sign that uh, some certain person move to one place from other place. But uh, there are patterns that uh, big companies, uh, big mobile operators gather. So they do uh, special in investigation for the governments about population activity and uh, uh, movement patterns. What we discussed uh, during the study, uh, if we see these two charts, if you look at these two charts, we have information from our uh, federal uh, statistic agency that is called uh, Rostat about the quantity of people that live uh, in our uh, agglomer agglomeration. And uh, they sh uh, show that uh, in Moscow, there are uh, 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 12, uh, tw uh, pe uh, 12 million people and in Moscow region, 7.5 uh, million people. But if we look at uh, geoanalytics, we see that uh, there is other uh, picture and we see that uh, uh, 
uh, in Moscow lives less people uh, than uh, our federal agency uh, shows us. Also, we uh, looked at the charts on the um, monthly change in the number of residents. And you see here the, this big uh, region, uh, you see how uh, these uh, uh, numbers, they grow in the summertime and how numbers in uh, Moscow city, they are down in the summertime because uh, a lot of uh, people goes to the uh, summer cottages and uh, uh, in summer vacation uh, season. Uh, so there are a certain movement. But also what we discovered uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, time and period, uh, a lot of people decided to stay at home. Uh, we know that um, uh, to stay at home, to work uh, remotely from their houses. Uh, uh, what uh, we want to uh, point out uh, here is uh, the city of Balashikha. It is here on the map. And people from Balashikha usually go to Moscow city, you see here, and uh, uh, the dots here, the places where they work. So a lot of people goes every day with uh, this uh, shuttle migration, every day uh, go uh, to work and uh, go to their homes. Uh, and it uh, makes a lot of uh, mm, pressure um, creates a lot of pre pressure on infrastructure uh, because uh, uh, a lot of people use uh, transport uh, underground uh, and uh, uh, their cars to go to their works. If you look at the city of Dubna, it is also the city of uh, our region. Uh, we see that uh, they have good concentration of people that live uh, there and work uh, from this uh, place. So uh, we, have, we have good uh, examples and bad examples. Um, now we move uh, to the uh, case of uh, Moscow as a city. If we look at the uh, chart uh, that is represented here and the map, we see that in the center of Moscow, there are more people. There is excess of number of places of employment uh, over the number of inhabitants. So people from this part, from red zones, they go to the center of uh, city to work there and go back. And also this part, uh, this is uh, the uh, southwest uh, part of Moscow that was attached to Moscow several years ago. And we see that uh, there is also uh, the problem of uh, uh, this uh, uh, pendulum migration. So what, this, uh, what uh, the government of uh, Moscow, city, city of Moscow, decided to, to do with that uh, situation, they decided to implement a special rule uh, for the investors that uh, con construct um, uh, the apartment buildings. Uh, they decided that uh, if uh, you want to, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, there is a special payment for change of permitted use of land. So uh, uh, if you want to build some, con uh, some uh, building, some con uh, construction, you, you uh, have to change uh, the uh, permitted use of this land. So you pay for that. And uh, for different projects, it is very big money. At the next slide, I will show you uh, the comparison. Uh, so, uh, they decided to implement new rule. Uh, when you uh, decide to build new building, uh, and if you have an intention to build uh, industrial facility, office facility with uh, 2000 square meters for industrial facility and over 5000 square meters for office facility, you can uh, get your money back uh, for, the, for this payment for uh, change of permitted use. So you can have uh, this uh, kind of exemption from payment. Um, you see the formula here, I will, I will not uh, speak about it. At the next uh, slide, I will show you uh, the cal calculation. 
for the construction costs of uh, uh, 17 story uh, building in different Moscow districts. And if you, for example, build uh, some uh, building in the Eastern Administrative District, uh, you can, um, you, you will have to pay this uh, payment fee. Uh, but if you, for example, uh, decide to build an industrial facility with 10,000 square meters outside of the uh, Moscow um, main uh, road, uh, you can have um, benefit of 13%. Uh, in South uh, West Administrative di District, we can also can have uh, the same uh, exemption, but it is more because uh, the uh, construction costs with uh, this payment is more and you can get more from the government of Moscow. So uh, you can have a uh, total uh, cost uh, uh, that is less uh, without uh, this PCPUL payment. And uh, if we speak about Troitsky and Novomoskovsky ad administrative districts, uh, I will show you the part of Troitsky, what you see here. This is a part of Troitsky and Novomoskovsky uh, districts. Uh, you can have uh, more benefit from that. It will be around 26%. So uh, the government decided uh, that they uh, want to make uh, the companies, investors, to build other places where can be um, the places with work, like uh, industrial zones and uh, office uh, facilities. That's it about my speech, and uh, I would like uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Akishev. Uh, we'll keep the question at the end of the section. Mm -hmm. uh, now I will uh, invite on the floor uh, Eduardo Colombo. Eduardo is a consultant operating with the government institution and uh, private uh, sector in the field of innovation and uh, technologies with a specific focus, which is uh, tourism. And this presentation will actually be exactly the focus on these aspects. Please, Eduardo. Okay, thank you very much. You did already. Did you see the, can you see the, the presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have. Okay, we, we see like this. And uh, so uh, you already said who, who I am, and I wrote this book uh, this year and be before the pandemics, and so I had to change something, and uh, something is changing every day. Uh, what is quite funny is that the preface was done by a Russian, uh, very famous uh, people, person, Eugene Kaspersky, and uh, uh, we are now in a in a position of uh, like the safety car. So we have to understand how the, the economics and the tourism will restart. And so what has changed? And uh, what is the, we have, we have to understand what will be the new normal, the next normal, the next normality. And uh, also to understand how to recover in the V, v shape. This was a, a forecast of last year and unfortunately it was not uh, right, and so we have to understand how to return to, to to the past. But the business will not be as usual. That will be the, the tourism business will change completely, and uh, because the fragility of tourism, uh, we, it's the first time that there is a, a, a crisis in uh, all over the world. Usually, maybe for an earthquake or maybe for uh, terrorism, there could be some areas that can be. Uh, affected by some some of these problems, some of the crisis. Now, uh, the, the problem is all over the world, and tourism is, is uh, uh, completely uh, reacts very very fast. And so the, the problem is very 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 fast to 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 be shared in the world. And so we have assisted to a mass adoption of technologies, and uh, this is uh, as uh, we can uh, add, as we 
can say to, today. Uh, that is, uh, uh, last year we were not able to use maybe Skype for in three people. Now we can use uh, Zoom, uh, Meets, uh, Teams, and all all these platforms. And so also this affected a lot of business uh, business travel because and now we have this new behavior that is uh, already uh, used by a lot of uh, companies. And so this will change completely the, the business travel and fairs and events. And uh, another trend is blockchain technology that can uh, be used, will be used to certify, maybe we can think to use it for to certify the um, identity or maybe to certify uh, who, who is immune or who has, uh, who has been vaccinated. And if, if in the past we used to uh, have a, a small book, a paper, paper book as a passport, in the future we will use some technology to, to be uh, to, to for visa or to to show that we are vaccinated. And so in the future, uh, in the future, it's not the future. is uh, is already used in some some places in the world using technology of recognition, face recognition, and this can be uh, uh, this can help maybe to to check in to 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 show a ticket, uh, a PNR. So it can helps to uh, to be recognized and to do something. Uh, in maybe to, to do a check-in in a contactless way, a touchless way, which is uh, the, the safer way. So this is very interesting because uh, people are now using technology not only for uh, like to, uh, like a nerd, but in the they use technology for safety reason. The safety reason and security reason is the most uh, is, is forcing people to use technology. And so this is uh, helping in some way. To, to develop technology and, and also to, to, to spread it. And another big problem is cybercrime. Cybercrime in tourism affected uh, maybe our identity, our payments. And so this can be uh, very, very dangerous as uh, maybe this uh, in the, the concierge uh, archives, archives the data in a very, very confused way. And so they, they can be affected by, by cybercrime and the acres. And uh, also we have to reinvent all the fruition of the uh, uh, cultural heritage. This is the Vatican, to, to, you can see with the virtual tour and also the exhibition and paintings can be visited in a different way. So this is the, the business model is reinventing. Uh, and also uh, we, have, uh, we have seen that uh, there are virtual experience to, to, to do cycling at home and uh, the Tour de France was uh, was uh, released in a virtual way, and, uh, and also through Google Maps and Street View, the virtual visit can be very, very easy to, to, to use. And uh, not only for cars, also for, for uh, walking and cycling. And so you can, there, there is the chance to visit some places all over the world in, in this way. This can help to promote and to develop new, new businesses. And uh, we have seen this also in gamification in the games or video games. This is uh, Assassin's Creed, which is a very, very famous uh, game uh, all over the world. And this is a, a place, uh, in Siena is placed uh, close to Siena in Italy. And so this was a, a very, very uh, interesting way to promote the, the tourism there. And also events, we have seen this, uh, this uh, incredible events of a concert and uh, there was a game to, to reach the place of the concert and then you can buy some garments and some cosmetics. And, and so uh, th this, this event was uh, followed by 12 million people over the world. And so uh, it's amazing to understand how uh, the business model can change from selling the ticket of a physical event to selling other, other things. And uh, and sorry, sorry. And, uh, and the other big, big, uh, the big players are changing also the, the approach to tourism. Google is completely changed from being only a media to be a, a direct uh, intermediator. So he's uh, he launched Google Travel and Google uh, and Google Hotel, and so they are selling. Google is selling directly, not uh, not only. Uh, through the OTA or online travel agency and selling directly and is disintermediating also re releases, uh, uh, reviews 
And, and so this on, on a single page, you can have the chance to, to see, to buy, and to, to, to do a review. So this is very, very interesting. And so is they changing the, the business model. Even uh, uh, Amazon is uh, approaching the tourism. This is a uh, uh, very, very new, new news. And uh, they are changing, they are approaching not selling uh, hotel or flights, uh, doing only an experiment in India by now, but they are selling uh, ex uh, sorry, experiences. And so they are starting from this country, not, not yet in Italy, not yet in Russia, uh, but they are selling virtual experience. So you can uh, learn and, and uh, how to cook something, or, or you can even send one with his smartphone to, to buy something in, in, uh, in Moscow, for example, in the future, but now in Berlin, for example. And uh, you can have the chance to have a two-way uh, audio connection and one-way video. So the, the, your kind of avatar can see and take a picture or speak with locals. And uh, so you can make a virtual visit. The virtual visit even on uh, Street View, so you can visit uh, uh, Venice and uh, the cost is uh, quite high by now. And uh, it is uh, done by the tour operator in Berlin. And uh, even you can learn how to cook in, uh, here. You can learn how to cook a classic pasta carbonara from Prague. And, and this means that uh, uh, you can also have, and, and you can also have the, the, the change of experiences. Even Airbnb changes its uh, experiences model and going to uh, virtual experiences. And so this is uh, the page of uh, Moscow's experiences, and uh, you can learn how to cook and uh, learn how to cook a pizza from a cook in uh, New York. On Zoom, we are on Zoom, and on Zoom is another platform that is selling also these experiences. And Facebook is going toward the, the virtual experience through the, the virtual, uh, uh, virtualized of uh, Oculus. Oculus is interesting because they are changing the experience to a, a community, a social way. And so you can share the, 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 the experience to, with other people. And this is very interesting for the future. And I think also for business, for the business that have created this platform to do and uh, an avatar and to, to do this meeting other people with their avatar in a single room. And so you can share maybe a presentation and you can uh, even talk about uh, a product and uh, create a, a meeting and a business meeting. And this is very interesting even because it is an augmented, you, you, when you think about an augmented reality, this is an augmented way to do a meeting. And uh, that the future will be uh, an interesting target is the digital nomads, the people that uh, used to work uh, being uh, always connected and, uh, and bringing all their work uh, through the cloud. And so they can be, they work wherever, from wherever. And uh, so they they are urban, sometimes they are urban, but they can do in, uh, in a different uh, uh, city, in uh, the same city or in another smart city. What is important is obviously to be connected. This is the only thing that they, 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 are, they care about. So in the past, we used to travel with big antennas now uh, with 5G and also uh, broadband will be easier. And uh, so this means that it will create a new business also for kind of uh, workation, which means work and vacation. So there are places that are growing where you can work, live and stay and uh, doing a, a community a kind of a community uh, to, to, to share and to share impression and to to have spacious uh, common areas, cooking and, and rooms, and obviously with the high speed internet. And there are some places growing, uh, maybe, maybe very rural and out of, of the cities. And uh, what is uh, what is to, to finish is the, the smart destination model is the way to, to look at, and this is the smart destination, uh, Destino Turistico Intelligente of uh, Spain which is uh, made of governance, which means uh, uh, how to manage all the, uh, the, the, the players that are private and public, and then also medicine and health, and uh, all, all the terms of, uh, uh, of the collaboration be between the departments. And uh, innovation is very important because there is the, the uh, manage of uh, traffic and flows and that thing.
very important by now, which is probably now very difficult because you, you don't have... We cannot hear you, Adrian. I cannot hear. You cannot hear me? Yes, now, now we can. Oh, sorry. Mm, I didn't. Okay. Uh, travel now uh, means that uh, you have to have uh, very, very keen information, very, very uh, actualized because uh, the changing uh, protocols of uh, COVID are changing. Maybe they cancel flights and they cancel uh, trains. And so this is very important to have something really uh, certain. And uh, so technology will help to, to use big data to understand all the flows, to understand the behavior, and to give a CRM to tourists and to, to dialogue with tourists and to also have a kind of uh, a way to, to do fideliz fidelization. And, and also sustainability is very, very important because uh, in tourism, uh, sustainability is uh, something that will be uh, will grow very very fast, and uh, it's uh, some info in some terms will, will be the, the most important uh, argument to tra for travelers. And accessibility the same for for people that have maybe some problems of elder people, not only people on wheelchair, and so uh, accessibility will be very very important in the future. Okay. Thank you, Eduardo. I don't know if there are any questions from the audience. I have myself a question for, for Mr. Akishev. I would like to understand how the, the geoanalytical data were affected by the pandemic and what measures were implemented in order to take into consideration these. And uh, maybe, uh, uh, Eduardo, you can, you can uh, uh, maybe elaborate on how we can increase the presence of uh, Russian clients in Italy in the next uh, summer season and of course of uh, Italian tourists to Russia. What measures can be implemented based on uh, the, uh, let's say, all the, all the interesting points and uh, trends that you, that you discuss, please. Thank you for this good question. Um, Actually, we uh, made a uh, special tender on uh, this um, uh, issue to analyze uh, how many people decided to stay at home at the uh, uh, Moscow region. Actually, they now uh, do this job and we don't have um, uh, the data, uh, but we know that uh, a lot of people, uh, more than 20 or 30 percent of people that uh, decided uh, uh, previously to go to Moscow city from Moscow region, uh, they decided to stay at home, to work from home. And we now realize, uh, we, we uh, learned it uh, from the, uh, the level of um, uh, the sale uh, in our uh, market, supermarkets, and uh, in comparison with other regions, in that case, these trade levels, they are higher than before, before pandemic time. So we know that more companies that sell goods, they have more uh, customers in Moscow region. And uh, in that certain way, we know that uh, if more people stay at home, there is more pressure on infrastructure and more money needed for that. And, uh, uh, mainly, uh, our government tries to have dialogue with federal center because we are centralized country and we have a federal budget system uh, and uh, inter budget um, um, uh, money system when uh, a lot of transfers goes to the regions. So these data we want to use for the uh, dialogue with federal center to ask uh, for uh, finance. For, for that um, certain um, uh, for, for that uh, certain uh, expenditures, but also uh, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, about trends with uh, digitalizations, um, we have uh, special programs uh, for uh, it is uh, in the App Store. Uh, you can download it uh, if you are a civilian from our region and. Um, to share your opinion over anything that uh, we have and uh, to, to send your um, uh, text to different ministries. 
And if you have some issues, some troubles, you can ask for help. Uh, and uh, our government use special kind of um, uh, input for that. And uh, uh, they try to respond in a very short uh, period of time. And every Monday, uh, the governor has special uh, discussion with uh, the heads of the cities uh, via Zoom, via this uh, connection uh, stuff. And uh, they try to uh, discuss uh, these issues, uh, especially that were connected with uh, COVID-19 and the, a lot of pressure were on uh, our medical uh, care system. And it was a, a big uh, effort of them. And we want to, uh, to thank these people that were connected with that. And it is very difficult. And I know that in Italia also, that was a big issue and a big problem at the beginning. And nowadays, I believe that it is better uh, in the region. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I confirm that's also in Italy. It's a, it's a big problem. And uh, well, Eduardo, what's uh, yes, uh, any ideas? I think that uh, it will be very, very important to have some information about uh, uh, vaccination. And uh, I, I take I, I will disappear one minute because I, I went to take this. It was the the certificate of vaccination. It, it is a, a very old. Uh, it was uh, used in the, in the past, and you have all the vaccination on it. So is, this is uh, hepatite, dipto, tifo, uh, anti polio, uh, uh, anti. And so you, this is an old way, but I think that we, with technology, we we need to use some technology to to certify that uh, if you are vaccinated and uh, immune, we can travel, creating some corridors. Uh, there are some countries that are now starting to do agreements, uh, Israel with Greek, Greece. And, uh, and so we, we need to, to understand that uh, this is the, the way to, to restart tourism in, in, the, in the, the beginning. And, and even there are some uh, people who is traveling only to do vaccination, this is another Maybe it's not a, a, a cluster, but sometimes uh, we know that Sputnik uh, vaccination is, uh, is in San Marino. It's possible to do uh, the, Sput the Russian vac vaccine, and so this can be uh, a, a way to attract uh, tourists in some way. And uh, they, it, they are doing something also in Dubai, in Cuba, uh, wherever. So I hope that it, we will not need uh, to do this, but uh, to use technology to help. Uh, to, to travel uh, back. Yeah. So vaccination passport is the solution, you think? OK, thanks. If there are no other questions, we can move to the next section. I would ask uh, Yekaterina to, to yes, circulate, please. yes, to circulate the new poll. We have the next poll, and I hope you will enjoy it. So please participate. So what's your position? First of all, we will have your opinion on the issue and then we will listen to the speakers and they can share their personal experience. Well, for now, that seems that everybody concludes contracts online, especially in pandemic times. So generally now we have a leader that there are some peculiarities, but generally the process is alike, concluding contracts online and offline. Well, as for me personally, I would partly agree with that, but I'd rather give the word to the speakers. Okay. So for the Russian side, uh, Raquel Tretiakova who is a specialist at Yandex. For those who do not know, Yandex is uh, biggest play in Russia, it's the equivalent of Google. They uh, 
are dominant on the market and uh, she deals with project in the in the field of communication and the digital contract so it's the right person to introduce us to this topic please Raquel go ahead We cannot hear your voice. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So uh, my presentation is going to be about uh, electronic contracts in business. Um, I'm going to talk about our experience in concluding such contracts and uh, our approach uh, to uh, such contracts. Uh, so, uh, the main thing here is that uh, nowadays there are still a lot of paper contracts uh, which are signed by hand, so to speak, and uh, there are still uh, a lot of difficulties connected to concluding contracts in the electronic form. And uh, nevertheless, uh, we as an international company try to um, get as far from that as possible to make everything digital, to make everything uh, more convenient and fast and uh, just uh, greater for everyone. Uh, there are, of course, uh, a lot of different ways now to conclude an electronic contract. There are a lot of um, things to consider, of course. Um, but uh, I've decided to talk about uh, service offer contracts. Uh, it's a particular type of contract, uh, which uh, is not maybe uh, doesn't really resemble uh, normal paper contracts, uh, because the main thing that is different uh, about those contracts is that uh, there is a public offer which is um, accessible via a link uh, on the internet which can be accessed by everyone and the terms and conditions of this contract uh, are just available as is on the internet. Um, you don't have to ask your, your potential um, uh, partner to send you like your general terms and uh, things like that. You can just uh, read through and um, just be aware of what uh, this contract uh, implies. Uh, so um, uh, the main uh, thing I want to talk about is uh, how these contracts uh, uh, are what they're like and uh, how they uh, can be used. Uh, so um, these contracts contain uh, links to some general terms and some um, conditions or applicable rules and those can be um, seen and uh, used by everyone. You uh, don't have to um, like change everything or like make um, some uh, uh, um, changes uh, to that. So these rules are already on the internet. Uh, they uh, cannot be uh, like changed because usually big companies don't just, you know, uh, decide when they to change the rules and just um, decide that they want to uh, make some differences to them. Uh, so um, then we have uh, the procedure of uh, sending bills, invoices, um, different acts uh, when we conclude a contract. Uh, usually that's done in, also in paper, the contracts in paper, but in case of the electronic contracts, um, it's easier because they're also uh, mailed or exchanged electronically. Uh, you don't have to use any paper or uh, like, you know, um, uh, things to, uh, you know, make the process uh, not really uh, a comfortable one. Uh, and uh, also one of the um, 
main things about the service offers are that uh, they are updated from time to time, and uh, they usually contain previous versions of the offer. So you can like look through and um, you know make uh, a, like a clear view of what the document used to look like. Uh, then we have uh, uh, some peculiarities which uh, pertain to the acceptance of such offers. Uh, the offers can be accepted, uh, for example, for, uh, from a web form. Um, that means that you go uh, to a website, you complete a form. Um, usually if uh, you have a firm, you complete the information about that firm. Uh, you provide all the necessary documents, you register, and then uh, you can go on and uh, like uh, receive uh, some sort of service or provide uh, some sort of service. And uh, uh, generally, I'd uh, uh, propose to make two um, kinds of the uh, such, such uh, contracts which can be accepted via uh, web forms. Uh, those are income producing contracts. That means that um, if you're a party which has the offer uh, listed on the internet and uh, you just search for uh, certain uh, customers, then these customers just, you know, accept uh, the offer you have to give to them. They don't usually have uh, any say uh, when it comes to uh, changing it drastically or like making some um, minor changes. It just doesn't work that way. They have to accept the offer as is and they accept it by completing this web form. Uh, and the second type of contract is a fund spending contract. It's um, a contract where uh, we as a partner suggest uh, like a certain offer and uh, this offer uh, implies that the person who will be our potential partner will earn some money from uh, you know accepting this offer and uh, following through with it. Um, it's the same procedure basically you register or you complete a certain form which asks you to give certain documents or provide certain uh, information about yourself uh, um, so that you as a customer or um, as a partner can be checked properly uh, now i'd like to show you what that looks like so on the bottom of the screen we have um, a service offer for one of our services. Um, you can uh, again go via the link and just uh, read through that. And uh, if you agree with everything uh, mentioned in the software, then you go to um, the top of the screen and you uh, complete this web form. Um, and you make uh, all the um, like necessary. Uh, ticks uh, so that you uh, accept uh, the rules of the game, so to speak. Um, that's another example of um, a partner registration form. You just fill in um, information about yourself and uh, all the necessary um, addresses and uh, contacts so that uh, certain documents can be sent your way um, if you decide to partner uh, with the company. Uh, then I'd like to talk a little bit about applicable law. Uh, in my experience, it's not much uh, of a discussion or much of a problem because it's really uh, rarely disputed and uh, it's usually provided on the contracts, uh, like in the offer or, you know, uh, in the contract because uh, if the contract is concluded between two firms who do business, uh, then it's just not that common that they uh, don't uh, make 
some sort of uh, agreement or term uh, on governing law. Uh, but uh, in case that uh, doesn't happen right away uh, or doesn't happen at all, then there is always um, a way to make everything right. Uh, if you go to court, there is always um, uh, potentially a possibility that uh, your uh, contract uh, will be reviewed and uh, the judge then will decide what the governing law of the contract is. And uh, in most uh, courts, um, internationally, it's uh, a significant relationship test that is used to um, decide on that uh, matter. And lastly, I'm going to talk about e-signatures. Uh, e-signatures are binding uh, and they are tied to the context of the document. Um, they are uh, a good thing because they're obviously much harder to, um, you know, uh, just be made by someone else or by an authorized person or, um, you know, you don't have to uh, doubt or verify that uh, by hand uh, or by asking your partner to provide some, um, you know, uh, stuff that can uh, prove that th that's the person who was supposed to sign the contract. You don't have to provide any supporting documents and so forth. Um, in uh, Russia, uh, e-signatures are regulated by a special law, uh, which uh, defines what an electronic signature is, what it implies, how it can be verified, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the parties who decide to use an e-signature uh, enter to a special contract and uh, they, uh, in that contract, agree on the terms of verification on uh, which parties uh, can use an electronic signature um, and uh, all the particularities of uh, using that type of, of verification. And uh, usually it's uh, an enhanced encrypted and certified digital signature. That means it's uh, safe. It's hard to um, just uh, use anyone uh, or just uh, some other person who doesn't have the right to sign a document. And um, it's definitely a way forward uh, and uh, will be used more and more in the future. Um, in my presentation, I have listed a couple of uh, electronic signature services that are most commonly used um, internationally and in Russia also. Uh, so I think um, that's it for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. We'll keep any questions for the later moment. Now, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Aleardo Furlani. Aleardo is uh, the founder and CEO of Innova. It's an incubator, Italian incubator. He, he is a leading, one of the leading Italian experts in the field of startups and innovation. I know that today will uh, present us a couple of uh, case studies. Please, Aleardo. Uh, thank you very much. Um, indeed, Armando, I will um, just share the screen right now. Um, I have to say, first of all, that I am honored to be part of this, uh, um, this event today. Uh, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you see the, the slide, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, I'm very honored to be part of this team today. I am um, very pleased because we don't have basically had any uh, uh, big opportunities to interact with uh, Russian experts uh, and with Russian um, uh, counterparts in government and business. So I take this opportunity as a starting point of collaboration that may take place during the next few months, I suppose, with support, with your support, Armando. So um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, the, the, one of the major, the major uh, constraints we are facing in these phases is related to the COVID-19 impact on our lives and our business. And uh, talking about e-commerce impact and the marketing operations, it would appear that the digital marketing transformation has not been uh, strongly affected by the uh, 
uh, by, the, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it would appear that, in fact, uh, uh, talking about uh, almost 8% of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the respondent to a recent survey published on marketing charts that come in October 2020 shows that most of the counterparts show that the uh, the marketing operation, digital marketing transformation uh, has not been seriously affected. This is a very important fact, showing that trading, the commerce, will be enhanced during a few months, regardless of whether the pandemic may increase or not. Um, uh, the e-commerce business practices in place, uh, uh, we are trying to discuss, with, uh, relate to three major points. One is the, the marketplace revolution, uh, retail 4.0, and, uh, and the supply chain improvements, and eventually the collaborative commerce. I'm just to, to try to illustrate to you uh, some few hints on how this is taking place all around uh, Europe. Um, first of all, retail uh, 4.0. Uh, we all learned, you know, starting from retail 1.0 to re retail 2.0, you know, with, with the hypermarkets, uh, supermarkets. And then, then uh, starting by mid 90s, the first uh, modern e-commerce platforms like Amazon or eBay or Zappos. And now we are moving to the retail 4.0, whereas the e-commerce plays, uh, I would say, an integrated role with the offline. Offline and online will create a sort of, sort of omni-channel, uh, uh, whereas the best practice has still in development. Um, the revolution is taking place because you, you, will, you will interact amongst companies, uh, B2B, but also B2C with the customers through interactive touch screens, uh, endless uh, uh, options to get to different opportunities, aisles in this case, assisted selling, self-guide shopping, and uh, strong customers engagement through virtual demonstration, virtual interactions, and um, enhanced user experience, shopping experience, allowing customers to learn, to enjoy more about the product, and of course, increase their purchasing intent. Uh, the, the point is that the supermarket is not only a place where we buy, but also where we learn. We learn about the products, we learn about the supplier, we learn about the delivery, uh, we learn about our health and the interactions amongst the, um, the uh, suppliers, the supermarket and the customers will become more and more important as shown in these slides where the exper experience sales side, the, uh, the, um, the endless styles where you can get access to much more products than what are shown in the shelves um, and the self-self kiosk that we see all around uh, uh, all around the world now uh, are showing you that the experience has to do with the knowledge with the fact that you know what you're buying you know uh, the origin of the place and this increases the value of the product itself um, in uh, uh, case study that i will talk about has to do with the, with the food chain and as Armando was saying, yes, we work a lot with startups and, uh, and uh, um, having a look at this, uh, this uh, uh, overview of the food tech, this is the first topic we will discuss, uh, the food chain integration in e-commerce. It would appear that uh, analyzing the uh, 900 emerging startups and technologies, it would appear that the food safety is making an important point here, uh, including smart packaging solutions, uh, based especially on IoT, to monitor whether the, the, uh, um, the, uh, you know, the, the chain, uh, uh, the freezing chain is working or not. The food monitoring from field to packaging to the use uh, are very important. And also the rise in demand expectation, food delivery, making use experience a priority, but also uh, 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 technology uh, build a link between eatery supermarket with successful then customers. So all these are facts. They show how important is becoming the food tech and the fact that you can get access to the food, but also to technology enabling the access to information regarding the food. Um, therefore, the interaction between the business has to do with the, with the number of actions that have to do from the food manufacturers to the distributor to the groceries to food retails. And, and, and the e-commerce e portal is the, uh, let's say, integration value chain, which allows uh, personalized offers, uh, uh, orders management, and personalized catalogs and pricing. So it's, it's one, one chain, including all the players in the, in the, uh, in the, um, in the system. Uh, 
Uh, we are very much interested in, uh, in blockchain recently because uh, we, I mean uh, Innova, but also in Europe uh, in general, because uh, the destructiveness of the blockchain technology is enhancing uh, security, tracking, quality controls. And uh, even the payments released by blockchain, once the delivery is confirmed, uh, they, 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 they are changing the way we, uh, we are uh, thinking about the trading. So the, the moment the moment uh, the moment that the grocery receives the uh, the uh, the goods to be put to be displaced in the shelves, in that moment the blockchain allows uh, allows the payment to the to the supplier without without intervention of the banks. So the payments are instantaneously made uh, because of the blockchain, and they are much more secure because they are linked to the fact that the product has been has been. Uh, has been coded, has been notarized, has been certified by the blockchain. And these are, these are aspects which are improving the overall reliability of the products and the, uh, and the, uh, and the perception of the, uh, the customers about the, about the product itself. Within, within uh, BHAB, we are working a lot in accelerating these, these, these systems in, in the blockchain and uh, uh, working a lot in blockchain technology uh, provide acceleration services and unlock new market channels with potential customers in the private public sector in, in Europe, but also I'd like to say in Russia, where we would be very happy to uh, develop uh, uh, constructive relationships uh, with, with the Russian counterparts. So I'll come to this point later on in my presentation. Uh, the, second, the second case is to do with the furniture. Uh, building a house, choosing the components and doing all this on the internet, this is something which uh, which is making a very big difference. So the, uh, the old, all the suppliers are linked together and they sell the, the bundled components to the public to make sure that they're able to develop their, their, uh, their, their house. And they can choose the supplier, they can choose the, the, uh, the, um, um, the price. They can make comments and provide uh, feedback on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on the product uh, once they have used it. So again, it's a question of integrating the different uh, corporates, the different businesses, which are part of the, of the, value, uh, the value supply chain. And, and you know, the technology is the enabling factor which makes this possible within the uh, retail 4.0, which is a new frontier uh, in this field. Um, uh, talking about furniture, uh, we have to also to talk about the needs of the of the of the new generations. The new generations paved the way to the the new needs. They anticipate the new needs. The Y generation, the millennials, they their motives, their needs are uh, are let's say cross cultural, cross country, and uh, uh, and they are they are they are, they, are, they specific priorities and uh, and uh, uh, and approaches. This is interesting because. The implication for e-commerce and for the marketing are quite are quite interesting. They are uh, requiring uh, to be more connected in high tech, inbuilt and invisible. They need personalization. They need to know what, you know how the supply chain uh, and the the origin of the product is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, is placed. So uh, this is generating a lot of a lot of changes, a lot of innovation. In the products, even a furniture like a table, like a, like a shelf or or whatever. Here in this picture, you can see a computer. Probably some of you may say, "Where is the computer?" It's not a computer here. I would say there are two computers, by the way. And the point is that the computer is invisible. Or sorry, the two computers here are invisible, and uh, um, and they represent the way by which you can interact with the with the uh, with the external world. And uh, you can interact because you can make your order. You can uh, you can uh, evaluate the performance of a specific supply. You can evaluate the quality of the food. The two computers are this. This is a lab, but it's not a lab. This is a computer, and this is a very nice computer. This is a cat, uh, the cat which incorporates voice recognition technology, which allows you to make your orders, to make your purchases, to check the quality of the air, to switch on the television, to call your friend, to check your emails. And you know you don't need the computer with the with the, that type uh, the, with the, the, the typewriter or, or whatever the screen that we are used to have. It's incorporated in your in your furniture. So the, your furniture is and this is an Italian 
patent uh, has to do with the fact that we don't want to have any more the, uh, the computers to be seen, but they are part of the way we buy, are part of the way we uh, enjoy the life. And this is, uh, this is really a new frontier that we are facing. Uh, as you see, there are many, many examples and many, uh, many, uh, many, um, let's say, variants, uh, sorry for using of this word, um, in, in, in use of the cats. Uh, but the cat has eyes, it can recognize you, it can uh, receive your orders, your, 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 uh, your uh, preferences, and learn about yourself and, and listen to you and obey to your orders. Conclusions. Uh, retail uh, 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 4.0 is, is a trend for the future. Uh, it is the way by which uh, the omnichannel will work, not only physical, not only online, integration of the two. I had a talk with the Italian Trade Commission very recently, and, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, while I was talking with them, it appeared that the, the major problem they're facing is to enhance the way the Italian companies can present their products in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, um, in different countries, because it would appear that any future the travels would be quite reduced. And it's important to make sure that the relationship between the distributor in Russia of Italian mozzarella or, or Italian machinery uh, uh, can provide a way by which the uh, distributor in Russia can learn really about the product, about the technology uh, in, uh, uh, through virtual representation. The blockchain is a way by which we can make these transactions and these interactions more secure and under control by the participants in the blockchain. And this is something that increases the value to the cybersecurity, adding more valuable uh, elements which make these, uh, uh, these transactions more reliable in general. And then the Indian functions, whereas we will have the way, we'll have chances to develop our ways to uh, get access to the market, which are not only the telephone, which are not only the computer, but all inbuilt functions that will allow us to interact with others. The enabling technologies are ready. The business models are on the way. I would say that concluding that e-commerce, but commerce relationship with Russia are very important. Russia has been traditionally a very important commercial partner for Italy, for Europe, uh, a very strong technology partner. And what's happening recently with the Sputnik vaccine, I believe is, is again a demonstration of the quality of the excellence of Russian science with respect to, uh, to the rest of the world. And we need to revamp the relationships and the e-trading and the tourism. And I hope that this could be really a starting point for enhanced collaboration for the future. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you, Aleardo, for your inspired comments and presentation. Uh, thank you for taking us through the landscape and uh, the evolution and transformation that we're facing nowadays. Uh, I don't know if there are questions from the audience. Myself, I have, uh, of course, uh, a curiosity. I'll ask to uh, uh, Raquel. Um, I know that uh, IKEA is uh, prepared and already did their first uh, transaction, uh, self-executing transaction with a smart contract uh, using an e-digital currency. I was wondering whether also Yandex is considering the use of smart contracts and uh, uh, what are the, let's say, the, uh, the projects you have in, in this field. Uh, well, I think that um, that's something to discuss. Definitely, it's a great idea. Um, but I don't think uh, that for now it's uh, uh, quite possible. And uh, um, I think that it will be great to uh, watch IKEA do that and uh, maybe learn from uh, them as they will be the first ones uh, to do something uh, that uh, futuristic, I think. Thanks. Aleardo, your, your impressions, I mean, you explain us the trends. Uh, what do you think can be done in order to improve the, let's say, the collaboration between Italy and Russia in, in the technology and the digital sphere? Uh, yes, uh, the technology is mean, is not, uh, uh, is not a an objective per se. 
So the, I think that the major the major issues is to uh, increase the let's say knowledge transactions amongst ourselves to see what could be the ways to uh, to make sure that what we do in Italy is useful for Russia and what what uh, our our Russian friends are doing is useful for Italy and uh, useful from the commercial standpoint, useful from the value generation standpoint and also useful of course from the technological standpoint and uh, uh, so I think that uh, probably working on specific verticals having to do with the, for instance agri-food and, and you know working on, on you know the needs of the uh, 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 of Russian counterparts and, and and Italian companies, and you know, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of food, food perception, um, food, uh, let's say, uh, information uh, and and pricing, and also we, this will also allow Italian companies to think about establishing themselves in Russia and to start, uh, you know, revamping the collaboration, not only based on export from Italy to Russia, but also to uh, develop a specific manufacturing production in Russia, uh, thanks to the, uh, to the, uh, to this, uh, you know, stability and the, the richness of the economic resources that we have in Russia now. Of course, the world is changing, but I believe that probably working more on verticals is a good way to go ahead in the future and to define areas in which the collaboration could be uh, turned into a plan of action. So to say what to be done in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we turn to the third section. I will leave Yekaterina to, to present the next poll. Well, yes, please. We are very interested uh, in the questions and the issues of cybersecurity, whether you care about it or not. So please enjoy whether you have any specialists or you have special policy in cybersecurity. Oh, well, that's so pity that nobody has an in-house hacker yet. I think I replied. Okay. Oh, well, it's very interesting that the situation is, uh, well, extremely equal. I mean, no. Uh, well, about a third of uh, present people have an in-house specialists. About another third has both policy and specialists. Another third has none. Uh, well, and uh, the uh, only person um, represents that uh, they have a, only an in-house policy, but no cybersecurity specialist. So, uh, well, we'll give the floor to the speakers who will show us how important it is to have policies, specialists, hackers, and everything that is necessary for cybersecurity. Yes, here on the, on the Russian side, we have Andrei Suvorov is the CEO of Adaptive uh, Production Technology, a company of the Kaspersky Group. So one of the worldwide leading experts in this field. Please, Andre, show us the risks and what we can do to face them. Thank you very much for introduction. Thanks for a nice idea to, to get feedback from audience. I suppose, and this is my proposal that for the next digital breakfast, we would ask people about not only cyber security specialists, but about cyber risk specialists. And I will explain why it's becoming more and more important. So give me one minute. I will try to switch to my presentation. Okay. Is it okay? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So uh, I would like during uh, next 10 minutes to, to cover uh, some topic, which is very important uh, to our team and I suppose to, to many customers uh, globally. And I would like to raise this topic, which is cyber risk. What is it for, for the company? 
And I would insist that uh, you, your colleagues, your partners uh, establish a specific uh, meeting for a top management team and ask these uh, two simple questions about what is it for the company and who is responsible for cyber risk in the room. But uh, before I will uh, jump to some statistics and some arguments, I would like to mention that uh, we have been working and living in a rapid changing environment. And the main definition of this environment is a cyber physical systems. Even for uh, retail industry, we deal with the cyber physical systems, connecting some physical walls like production or logistic with the trucks uh, and with some sensors and computer systems. It's not anymore in terms of cybersecurity to provide safety and security for smartphone or for laptop. We have to provide security on full uh, chain from the source signal up to dashboard of the person who is uh, reading uh, reports uh, inside his uh, luxury car. I have been following personally for uh, the statistic which Allianz uh, Group published uh, on annual based. Uh, sorry for, for Russian uh, title. Uh, it is mentioned that top 10 business risks for, for 2021, it's a new priorities. But let's have a look. Cyber incidents in 2021, based on 2020 results, this is a big European survey. So cyber incidents are on third place. And you see that number two is undisputed uh, pandemic outbreak, but business interruption also has a, a clear correlation between uh, dependency on technology and uh, unplanned outages. And I will, Prove it easily uh, with uh, some uh, coming slides. So cyber incidents for uh, business people means a lot. For your information, uh, it's, it was about seven years ago. So now it's about third place. Seven years ago, it was number 13, which means that if our top managers still think like they did it 10 years ago, they will not manage modern risk properly. It is definitely the case to think about what did change within my organization, why people think that cyber incidents are important, are among top risk for the business, and what does it mean for my business? So this is an idea which, uh, have been confirmed by many, many experts, and we see this uh, trend. If we accept that we deal with a new type of risk, it is well known from the business series that we can accept the risk, transfer, and mitigate. For today, I will touch very quickly only a couple of topics, which I hope will be relevant for you or for, for your colleagues. So I will try to mention the topic uh, of CXO communication in the area of uh, acceptance. And we'll briefly provide you some information about dramatical change in cyber insurance law. First topic, I am stating very seriously that our top managers globally, Russia, Italy, uh, Asian countries, etc., they are still very naive in terms of cyber risk management. They do not care about security. They do, but they do not. They have a strong perception that for them personally, cyber security, it's something which is happening in a small room with a cyber security officer who always try to propose some invoices for a small piece of technology. That's it. And these high level people, high level persons, do not understand a clear link between only one incident 
and possible erosion of the profit, which can be comparable with the annual profit of the big companies. Believe me, we have a lot of uh, cases with collection when it does matter, when one incident can cost to the company very, very big amount of money. Of course, and this is a big uh, challenge, not only for C-level to understand what is going on in the level of cyber risk, but also for security guys who have to change their language if they're going to deliver appropriate story about cyber risk. So they have to change some terms which are familiar for technology guys like antivirus, firewall, uh, network segmentation to completely terms which are clear for business people like risk reduction, like efficiency or consistency of the business. In this case, it will be some more progression and we will have agreement between C-level and security guys. And this is serious uh, challenge, as I mentioned globally. Uh, let's have a look on real case. So I, I, I was a leader for, for the project. Uh, it was uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, for all of you, if you are not specialist in uh, oil refining, I just mentioned, that this is the typical uh, picture of oil refinery plant. You can see here with a red tube catalytic reformer unit, which is a very expensive technology piece of the plant. It produces high octane uh, light uh, petroleum, which we use for our cars. So we uh, started the project with assessment, and this assessment very quickly gave us some information that there is a vulnerability on the level of electronic document system, which top management, top management use from mobile devices. So usually they use it to put some mark in the contracts or provide some uh, workflow initiation, etc. So first step, we discovered vulnerability, which means that it would be real to intercept all possible transaction uh, on the high level uh, user for the system. Then using this high privilege account, we can spend some time to understand that within enterprise network, there is a, some engineering machine, which has a connection to the plant. And then having such access to this engineering machine, Again, our researchers spend some time to understand what are the protocols, what are the type of uh, technology elements are below this engineering station. And they concluded that from the Wi-Fi connection somewhere in CAFE, with the knowledge of this electronic document management system vulnerability, it's possible to get a connection to this very expensive piece of hardware. Then some bad guys or girls with a bad agenda may check internet and discover that this type of equipment from this vendor with this number of uh, software has a set of uh, real exploits. So if uh, you can download this exploit, you can get control on this uh, big, big uh, piece of hardware. We had a very interesting discussion with the engineer of this plan. We delivered all this information about vulnerability on the level of corporate network, about possibility to get inside operational technology uh, environment, and about uh, real uh, vulnerabilities of uh, these uh, industrial parts. And we concluded, by the way, it was a part of report that for such level of protection, uh, it would be possible to demolish all this, uh, all this stuff within a refinery unit for three hours instead of real work, three months. So again, with the current level of protection, we did real strong arguments that by special commands, 
we could demolish this uh, catalytic reformer unit in three hours only by some comments. And then it would be some alarm system stop and uh, they have to uh, uh, put significant investment. So in our case, instead of delivery traditional paper, the uh, director, we have to buy for some specific licenses or firewalls. We proposed to deliver this information in another way to emphasize on some increased volume and cost of one hour downtime and with some specific statement about platinum capsules which could be demolished in three hours and i think if we will be able to build such story with the business terms which will be related to particular findings not theoretical uh, threats but particular findings it will be good alliance between business and security guys my second and last topic for today's small discussion is about cyber insurance. Uh, it can be a surprise for many of us if we will check our existing cyber uh, insurance contract, which uh, of course may include uh, cyber. So with the current regulation, which is global, uh, uh, it covers by three main law. There is no case I will just write it down, insurance, caused by computer, computer system, or computer software program. So if it will be proven that uh, some machinery breakdown was caused by computer routes or by software failure, insurance company will say, sorry, it is outside of my responsibility. And currently, main insurance cyber insurance contract cover only product uh, recovery so they will pay only for engineer who will come to the site and who will provide some data recovery services no coverage of uh, unplanned outage some losses no coverage some uh, broken machinery if it may happen if uh, it may happen like i described in oil refinery plan and of course, uh, we see a big demand from the market. So we have a partner uh, from insurance brokerage uh, domain. You see a reference to the marsh. So we see the high demand of customers who faced recently uh, with the claims, with the incidents, and they require significantly change cyber insurance. So my, uh, my second uh, proposal, I think, uh, if we uh, will have another meeting, so cyber insurance uh, people can deliver more information. But uh, luckily, based on this demand, based on uh, the topic uh, we uh, have raised recently, we see that current cyber insurance offerings may include different type of events, you see uh, in the bottom part of my screen, like asset breakdown, business interruption, etc. So now it's more or less real with the relevant cyber risk we may face. So uh, as a conclusion, I would like to mention two statements. Number one, uh, I presented today only a small portion of uh, today's uh, unique course, which is cyber risk for C-level. So we can uh, repeat it in, uh, in any time uh, with the uh, audience which are interested of this topic. And secondly, I have a strong perception that between Russian companies and Italian companies, we may have a stable uh, coordination uh, in the area to create IIoT products. So you are very famous and there are many Italian companies in the field of engineering. From other side, Russians, like our team, are famous from uh, programming, from application development. So we can combine and we can uh, build secure, uh, uh, secure products, secure solution in the area of industrial internet. Of Thank you very much. I will be happy to answer a question when time will come. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Andre. Very interesting presentation. Uh, we know the risks, we know the the level of risk you're facing and what we can do in order we are to... strong we are strong right now <laughs> okay we trust on you
Now I pass the ball to Marco Assirelli. Uh, Marco coordinates uh, various projects related to cybersecurity uh, with uh, personal data protection and information security aspects. Uh, please, Marco, you can move with your presentation. Yes, thank you, Armando. I now share the screen. Can you see it? Not yet. Now, oh, yes, we can see it. OK, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I work for BiviTech Group, uh, which, um, which is, uh, um, let's say, a group uh, with more than 1,000 employees and 100 million of annual turnover. And uh, it's a group of innovative companies founded in 2005 uh, and active uh, in the field of Industry 4.0. This term, uh, as we all know, encompasses a wide range of items, uh, among which a place of particular importance is occupied by uh, cybersecurity one of the most current and uh, important issues in the global scenario. As recently also stated uh, from the Global Risk Report uh, of the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, 2021, which stated that among the highest likelihood risks of the next 10 years, there are cybersecurity failure among others and among the highest impact risks of the next decade, IT infrastructure breakdown. So um, if on one side, in fact, we can find, let's say, common physical threats like terrorist attacks, piracy and armed robbery, hacktivists, competitors, disgruntled or former employee. On the other side, uh, we find as many common cyber security threats like malware, so ransomware, adware, spyware, botnet, and so on, like phishing, uh, like man in the middle attack, like denial of service or distributed denial of service. The lowest common denominator of both is identified in the massive transversal economic cost, consisting in danger of personal safety violation, personal data violation, damage to private property, service interruption, as we already anticipate, uh, uh, in the previous slides, damage to assets and infrastructure and uh, insurance uh, losses. So the increase uh, in cyber attacks uh, combined with uh, the spread use of uh, technological tools uh, in, let's say, people's everyday life requires uh, an ever increasing protection of corporate assets uh, from cyber threats capable of, let's say, exploiting the vulnerabilities present uh, in any organization. So such consideration uh, have led uh, uh, governments to regulate these aspects, ruling out cyber laws, so-called cyber laws, for instance, GDPR for Europe, um, as well as the Network and Information Security Directive uh, and other uh, local uh, implementing uh, legislations and uh, international standards like uh, ISO standards, NIST framework, COVID, uh, ISACA, and uh, uh, local guidelines such as government institutions, international agency, and data protection authorities. So, um, organizations uh, are not only obliged to ensure on a permanent basis that they are adequate in terms of uh, the so-called uh, CIA paradigm respect, uh, of, uh, which means uh, confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability. But the, um, they also need to be stepped with, um, let's say, cyber attacks evolution of the context uh, they operate in. So as a fundamental activity for uh, the prevention of cyber attacks, and for the protection of both 
personal and business data. Uh, let's say the main sector legislation prescribe uh, the, the carrying out uh, of risk management uh, and risk assessment uh, activities consisting of uh, the, the, the following uh, steps, which are context establishment in both internal and external, defining the criteria, the different criteria I, I should operate in, risk identification with uh, evidence-based methods such as, um, for instance, checklists or reviews of historical data, uh, inducti inductive reasoning technique, uh, risk analysis with control assessments, consequence analysis, likelihood analysis, and uh, probability estimation of occurrences of such risk. And then risk evaluation for the risk assessment part, uh, uh, which means uh, a question such as need of treatment, priorities for treatment, activity to be undertaken. And then we will finish with the risk treatment, uh, which generally consists in a plane, which is called the risk treatment plane, when uh, the company can select and, um, and agree to one or more activities to be carried out in order to comply with the law and with the uh, technical organizational security measures. So um, we can see how uh, these activities uh, are activities of uh, the so-called management systems. So, uh, in, as, a, as a senior consultant in Bibutech, uh, we support uh, Interalia um, companies uh, to develop and implement uh, a certified management system. For instance, uh, the certified ISO uh, 271 management system, which is an information security management system, um, which includes a set of procedures, policies, uh, rules, um, and also training for the uh, employee in a manner to uh, protect the company's hardware, uh, software and asset in general from uh, cyber, uh, cyber risks. So these are basically the three main ISMS impact areas, which can be found, uh, let's say, in most of the contests we, we, we operate. So the physical area, the IT area, and the, the uh, documentation area. Of course, in each area, there are peculiarities, but we can apply, um, we can apply the, the, the same policies, the same procedures, and the same processes uh, uh, interacting each other in the same organization. The, the management systems are applicable, uh, as already said, at any reality, and then they can be adapted to any uh, specific, uh, um, let's say, operational context. What does it mean? would mean that, um, for instance, we collaborate in a defense and space project to develop uh, armed forces asset digitalization or to develop uh, um, new, um, new solutions and services for uh, smart local public transport uh, or new um, banking solutions such as software for digital payments or uh, mobile uh, and uh, internet banking, as well as for the finance, financing sector uh, with fraud prevention or detection and uh, decision support system, as well uh, as in healthcare, public administration and uh, uh, digital infrastructures, sectors where the, let's say, digital transformation process uh, is increasingly needed. So um, we, uh, as already said, um, as already anticipated, uh, um, Bivutech, uh, let's say, uh, does operate in all these target markets and uh, de um, develop and implement the, the, lat the, the latest cut 
cutting edge, let's say, uh, information security solutions. So we can find uh, um, risk assessment and uh, treatment activities, business continuity plan and disaster recovery plan to build resiliency in the organization. On the other hand, the incident handling. As we saw, uh, incident response, uh, incident, cyber incident response, uh, it's of utmost importance uh, uh, for, for the time being and for the, time, uh, and for the future, as well as the root cause uh, analysis. And then there is uh, the, the, the legal part uh, um, with, the, with the compliance uh, uh, operational support to, uh, to, the, to the main legislative framework, such as GDPR, NIST, ISO, uh, and various, uh, uh, let's say, international and European uh, and worldwide policies, as well as the active defense uh, Carrying, uh, carrying out uh, uh, vulnerability assessment and uh, uh, penetration test, uh, security engineering uh, activities or uh, code review uh, and software development uh, life cycle, as well as uh, uh, threat hunting and uh, red teaming and uh, harness. To, 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 end, uh, to end up with uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, with main uh, uh, solutions regarding early warning, uh, threats monitoring, uh, and uh, uh, information uh, sharing. Of course, there are on, um, extremely ongoing uh, activities such as uh, technical and um, periodical technical and ex executive reporting. Um, drafting of, of uh, processes and uh, procedures, uh, such as uh, operative instructions to personnel, to be followed by personnel, and uh, the uh, personal training uh, uh, itself. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention, and uh, it has been a pleasure to, to be here with you. Thank you, Marco. Um, now, if my, I think you both mentioned uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, the risks that are involved in, uh, in the digitalization, but you also mentioned some other aspects which I think are also relevant. I mean, one of them is definitely what Andre mentioned is the language barrier. So. Uh, lay people are normally don't understand the uh, technical terms and sometimes it's uh, this is a uh, one of the reasons they think it will never happen to me because uh, i mean if you don't understand clearly the risk and the language uh, you you tend to think that you may be not vulnerable or at least uh, when it will happen i will take some measures and that would happen in the in in reality uh, I would ask to both uh, Andre and, uh, and Marco, what, what can be done in order to improve, uh, let's say, the communication uh, from, let's say, the technical language of uh, cybersecurity to, to, let's say, to the managers and officers of companies? Uh, if I can, I, I may start uh, briefly with some statements based on, on real practice. Uh, by the way, I, I would recommend uh, if you may get an access to uh, Davos Forum uh, 2018. It was a brilliant uh, video with uh, Mr. Jim Hageman Snabe, who is the chairman of the Maersk Group. Maersk is the largest logistic company. So he delivered a brilliant speech about his uh, early morning on May 25th, 2017, when a big cyber incident happened. And this incident caused 10 days manual management of the global company. I liked it because of very honest story. He shared it with the numbers, with a message about naivety on the level of top managers, and with a strong message that it will not happen anymore in his company. So to do this, 
I would recommend one simple advice, at least arrange dedicated boardroom meeting with a simple agenda, cyber risk for my company, and has a clear discussion about how can we understand what may happen and what is for unplanned outage for one hour or for one day within the company. It will definitely help after to understand how it will be balanced between uh, cost of security solution and cost of unplanned outage. So that's that's it from my side for, for today's discussion. Marco, please. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with, uh, with Mr. Andre. And uh, for me, one, one solution could be, for instance, uh, to build, to, to draft common security framework uh, or a common uh, security uh, terms uh, uh, tailored to the specific context uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will operate in, uh, such as health, healthcare systems, transport systems, uh, financing and banking, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in order to develop uh, the, um, uh, an, an unique, maybe, uh, modus operandi, uh, risk methodology, or uh, uh, risk uh, solutions. So an harmonization is really uh, difficult, but uh, we are, I, I'm convinced that the, um, the cyber world is different uh, in respect to uh, the, the, the normal world that we are, um, we are, uh, we are living until now. So uh, there, there will be an hope uh, to, to find uh, a, common, uh, a common solution, a common harmonized solution, let's say. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the replies and thank you for the interesting presentation on, of all the speakers. Uh, can, can, I I think... please, can I please intervene yes, for well, sure. a couple of words? You know, uh, I've been thinking about your question and it's a very interesting uh, how to communicate with people that there is a problem about this special terms, about this uh, difficult issues that uh, we have to, pro to, to, to provide cyber security. You know, our, one of our graduates uh, now deals with a very interesting idea to visualize a difficult language of contracts for, uh, well, everyday life for, uh, well, uh, average people. For example, if you don't understand why to include or not include one of the terms into the contract, it's visualized and it's explained in very plain words and uh, in pictures. We can do the same thing for cybersecurity. We can visualize, we can use very plain and very easy words to, 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 to make people understand that cybersecurity and risk management, it's a very important issue for, uh, well, every legal entity, for every economic entity in our life. Thank you. Very interesting proposal and also a, a nice idea for the follow-up. Any comments from Andre or Marco? I have only comment that uh, it's nice to know and I think this is a, one of the reason of today's breakfast that we have many similarities with the Marco's team and uh, some more clarity after our presentations within our audience. So definitely I would like to continue professional uh, discussion on our topics. So thanks for, for the event. Thank yeah, you to totally. all. Yes, please, Marco, go ahead. No, I totally, uh, just saying that I uh, was totally agreeing with, uh, with Andre. Yeah, I think that's probably the purpose of our uh, round table. So to try to, to understand each other by understanding the similarities and uh, how we can work together or, or how we are facing the same problems. Having said that, uh, I will uh, conclude. I, I would like to thank all the, all the speakers for the nice and interesting presentations and also for the suggestions for next seminars. And uh, we will definitely take this into account for, uh, for organizing the, the next event. Uh, I don't know, Yekaterina, if you want to follow up and um, maybe uh, give a few words uh, and conclusion, please. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm extremely happy with our fruitful cooperation in general. Uh, we have been working together for a really long time. We have uh, arranged a um, very big conference and now we have this very nice format of digital breakfast. Uh, now we can use uh, a lot of technical um, possibilities uh, to make it uh, throughout the world. Uh, and uh, I sincerely hope uh, that our cooperation continues and we have some more scientific events. And thank you very much, all the speakers and all the participants. And uh, again, I sincerely hope that uh, much more people will watch this event online and maybe find out a lot of necessary information for themselves, because uh, I guess uh, that this event was extremely useful for today digital society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ekaterina. So once again, thank you, everyone. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you very much indeed. See you at the next seminar then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.